Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. So, um, just a quick uh, introduction. So, this is Kelly asked me to speak, and the truth is, I, I often would say no, but this is a really important topic, and she told me to learn about the Holocaust, and I'll tell you why it's an important topic to me. Obviously, if you look at me, I'm Jewish. I'm a rabbi. A rabbi means that, you know, I'm a head of a Jewish congregation, but I also, in particular, I am a grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. My grandparents all were in the Holocaust. Uh, they were all from Poland. Um, my, I'm d- named after my two great-grandfathers, both who were murdered in the Holocaust. My mother, uh, both of her parents were married before the Holocaust. Both of their spouses were murdered in the Holocaust. And my mother is a product of a marriage of two people who got married, remar- got married after the Holocaust. After lo- losing their first spouses, uh, my grandfather uh, actually saw his first wife and two kids shot in front of his eyes. So I look at the Holocaust as really, really important. My parents grew up without cousins, without grandparents, without aunts, without uncles, without extended family, because they were all from families of Holocaust survivors uh, from Poland. My wife uh, her, and her mother's side, they were from Hungary, and her grandparents, too, are Holocaust uh, survivors. So I look at this as a really uh, important topic. So I was asked to speak today about spiritual heroism. I understand you're learning about the tragedies of the Holocaust, at least some of it. But today we're going to talk about spiritual her- heroism. So I, I actually, I think that the way I got asked to do this lecture, this past Sunday, I gave a lecture to a, a much older crowd of Holocaust survivors and their children um, in Los Gatos. And that crowd, they were either survivors or, or children of survivors, and they were om- probably 90% Jewish. So if you have questions for me, if I say any term that you don't understand, just raise your hand, and I'm very happy to answer it. I remember, um, you know, when I was in high school, maybe you won't believe this or not, I went to a, a, a Jewish high school, and I played on the basketball team. No. I was not the center, and I was not the forward. I was, the, I, was a, I was a point guard. So I remember we had a, co- I had a coach, and my, our coach was, was a non-Jewish coach. Very, very friendly, loved us. He was very close to us. But I remember he, we came into halftime one time, and we were losing pretty badly, and he was really upset at us. His name was Coach Means. We so always joke around. He was really mean. So he comes into, the, he comes into the, at the halftime, and he starts berating us. He says, guys, you're getting killed. You're getting killed out there. Now, we had won the championship a couple years before. We were a pretty good team. But that game, we were getting slaughtered. We were really losing out. And he, says to, he said to us the following comment. He said, you know, you guys give up so easily. If, you know, it reminds me of the Holocaust. If you just would have fought back, if you just would have fought back at the Nazis. Now, he was trying to motivate us. I want you to know that. He didn't mean to say something anti-Semitic or anything really negative. He said, but if you would have just fought back, you would have for sure beat back those German Nazis. Now... I don't know how motivational that was, but the truth is that thought process, if you just would have fought back at the Nazis, um, you would have beat them back, it came from somewhere. So I just want to, just before I speak about spiritual resistance, I want to talk briefly about how difficult physical resistance was against Nazi Germany. Because people ask this question, why did you not fight back? So just first of all, there were very few famous cases of strong physical resistance to the Nazi regime. Number one, there was a revolt in the Warsaw Ghetto. That took on for several weeks. Uh, That was in the middle of World War II. It actually took the Nazi war machine several weeks to to quash that revolt. There were uprisings in three, uh, at least three times in the major uh, concentration camps in Sobibor, in Auschwitz, and in Treblinka. All examples of uh, resistance to the Nazis. However, um, the stark reality was is that the Nazis were extraordinarily difficult to, to resist against. And let me tell you reasons why. Has anyone ever been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C.? Anyone else? It happens to be, just cover there. It happens to be a, an excellent uh, museum. And one of, the, um, it, one of their pamphlets actually discusses the obstacles to physical resistance against Nazis. Number one was the superior armed power of the Germans. Poland, the the country of Poland, fell to the the Nazis within three weeks. 
France, France, which was until World War II one of the two, three greatest armies in the world, fell to Nazi Germany in six weeks. Okay, they were crushed by the Nazis. So, taking an unarmed people, unarmed, they didn't have arms, they didn't have tanks, they didn't have planes to start, to fight against the Nazis was extraordinarily difficult. Number two, the Nazis practiced something called collective responsibility, which means as follows. If you did anything of armed resistance against the Nazis, they took, took revenge against many people. Therefore, a few examples. In, in, in Donilov, which is in, in Lithuania, they killed an entire ghetto of hundreds of people because two boys escaped. That means if two people escaped from the ghetto, they massacred everyone else as a lesson not to do things. In Bialystok, which is a city in Poland, uh, uh, one Jew shot a German, and the German just murdered 120 people. So if you, start, if you attack the Nazis, they would kill many, many innocent people to teach you a lesson not to do that again. The third reason was, of course, uh, there's isolation of the Jews and a lack of weapons. Um, unfortunately, the, 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 the local populations of where the Nazis, the reason they brought Jews into Poland to do the Holocaust was because, in general, the local population had uh, a more ancient anti-Semitism. So that's why the, the Jews from France and from Greece and other locales around Europe were brought into Poland and area because there was an, a, more of an ancient anti-Semitism, which is not my focus today, but the Jews couldn't really hide as, as easily. And number four is the Nazis uh, put on a lot of, um, uh, they did a lot of things to, I'd say, to hide what they were doing. So for example, they would make people, when they got to Auschwitz, write postcards, you know, Hello from Auschwitz. Life is good here. If any, does anyone, has anyone ever seen the rail tracks going to Auschwitz, what it says? It, well, it says in German, Arbit macht free, which means if you work here, you'll become free. If you work here, you'll get rights. And really, it was deception because 90-something percent of the people that came to Auschwitz, almost 2 million people were, were gassed to death or burned there. 90-something percent would die within the first couple hours. But when they walked in there, they didn't want people rioting, so they put on a deception. So fighting against the Nazis was really, really difficult. And yet, there are many examples of this occurring. Other examples uh, on a smaller level, one of the, one of the greatest sages of, of, uh, in, uh, uh, in Poland, Rabbi Leiner, told all Jews to fight in the ghettos, in the forests. A, a great Hasidic rebbe in Lithuania called the Slanima rebbe. His basement was uh, used for the resistance. Um, but again, the, the, the odds and the, and, the, and the responsibility, if you shot a Nazi, they would kill your, everyone around you. It was very, very hard to fight back against them. And what many Jews, although they fought, they, 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 the main resistance, and that's what I'm going to speak about today, is spiritual resistance. Because, you know, when you, for the Holocaust, there's a big concept in history, and certainly Jewish history as well, of remembrance. And you, know, you can remember why people died, but it's also important to, to remember for what people lived for. And one of the things the Nazis tried to do was not only to physically destroy um, the, the, the people who they attacked. Now remember, the, the Holocaust, I'm coming as, uh, as a Jewish person, the genocide of the Holocaust was, uh, la was largely against the Jews, but they certainly attacked and killed many, many people. They killed all kinds of Russian POWs. They killed gypsies. Um, they killed uh, homosexuals. The Nazis, had, uh, if anyone resisted them. Uh, but one of the things they did, in particular against the Jews, is starting in the 1930s in Germany, uh, with the Nuremberg Laws, was to destroy all Judaism, to destroy all humanity in the, in, in the Jewish people. So I'd like to give a few examples, just a few today, in the limited time I have, about how Jews fought back during the Holocaust. And I'm going to start, I'm not, I don't want to read stories, but I want to read one letter, because this individual I know, I knew, he passed away. He was a survivor of five concentration camps. Um, and uh, he was ultimately an editor of a, a, a newspaper in New York. His name is Rabbi Joseph Friedensen. And he says as follows. I remember the day very clearly. It was September... 
1939. And we knew the Germans were amassing on the Polish border. Now, actually, on the German trains, there's a famous picture of the, one of the German trains t- t- taking troops. They were going into Poland, and on the, the train, one of them is a picture of it saying, we're going into Poland to crush the Jews. Poland, in 1939, was approximately 11% Jewish. Okay? Germany, in 1939, less, was less, when we talk about German anti-Semitism in the Holocaust, was less than one half of 1% Jewish. The Jews were a very, very small minority in Germany. They were a larger minority, about 11%, I think, uh, when you talk about my, you know, people from a minority background in America, 11% is a large percent of the population. So in, it was September 1939. We knew that the Germans were amassing on the Polish border. An order had come from the Polish government to be all boys over 16 years old all had to report to Warsaw to fight against the Germans. So my father and I set up from Warsaw. And then he talks about how by the time they left Ludz, to get to Warsaw, the, which was three days, the Polish army had already collapsed against the Germans. And he says, he, he begins this story with an attempt to respond to the ridiculous claim of those who say that six million Jews went to their deaths like sh- sheep to the slaughter. Nothing, this is his testimony, nothing could be farther from the truth. They, were, they were, went like heroes of spirits, Anyone who thinks that the Jewish masses could have united to defeat Germany should just ask how the mighty govern- Polish government did. If the Polish army could not last three days under the Nazi onslaught, how could anyone dare say that the civilian Jewish population could have successfully fought back? In the five plus years that I endured under Nazi occupation, torture, and degradation, I can testify that they never broke the collective spirit of the Jews. They may have been physically stronger, but they never defeated us. The Germans, by perpetrating the most heinous acts of barbarism in the annals of mankind, acquired a place in history. But it was the wrong side. The real heroes were men like my father, with blessed memory, who in the Warsaw Ghetto opened his window to throw scraps of bread to the starving, crying children outside. And when I said to him, Tata, Tata's dad in Yiddish, which is a Jewish language, what about us? His answer rings in my ears today as clearly as a day he spoke to, to, to the, them. Tonight, we have enough bread. Tomorrow, let God worry. Who would ever let, uh, allow their children to marry in the ghetto? The seeming death sentence ho- hovering over the young couple's heads. Well, I got married in the Warsaw Ghetto. Now, this Jew, Rabbi Friedensen, who passed away a couple years ago, his granddaughter, his dozens of grandchildren, was, was my wife's best friend. That's how I know this person. Uh, well, I got married in the Warsaw Ghetto due to the heroes of spirit like my father, who quoted the prophet Isaiah, how just like Sancher, who went from being high and mighty down to his ultimate two feet, so too will Hitler and his cohorts. And heroes like my Rebbe, who promised my mother-in-law that if he allows the wedding to take place, Remember, 90-something percent of the people in the Polish ghetto would die in the Holocaust. Uh, He guarantees we will both survive the war. They were the true heroes. In the slave labor camp, I can testify how Jews baked matzahs. Does anyone know what matzahs are here? So matzahs are Passover. It's a Jewish holiday. It's unleavened bread. It's it's a bread that Jews eat on uh, on Passover. So it's, it's like very thick uh, thin cracker-like bread. Um, how Jews baked matzahs in the 2,000 degree smelting ovens with the cooperations of our German or- overlord. I remember his incredulous look when he asked us how we could worry about God in the situation we were in. Didn't your God forsake you? He asked. One of the elders in the group responded. Now this is in the middle of the Holocaust to, to the question by a German Nazi, did your God forsake you? Not totally, and not forever. He took a step back, this Nazi. He said, I'm afraid that the Fuhrer, Hitler, will never be able to defeat such a people. That elder was a true hero. In the slave labor camps, in the extermination camps, 
in, on the death marches, this Jew was on all of these, at the firing squads, Jews went, went to, to heaven with Shema, which is a Jewish prayer we say morning and night, uh, attesting that God runs the world, and with Animan, which is the 13 Jewish principles of faith in their hearts. They were true her- heroes of spirits. The 6 million ju- Jews who died were heroes of spirit. So I'd like to discuss a few of these acts of heroism. When the war started, so when Nazis, the Nazis came into Poland, like, they tried to break a lot of the Jewish spirits. So for example, there was one time, this is, uh, they came into near Lublin, which is a very large city in Poland. And a, a, a large percent of Polish Jewry were Hasidic Jews. Anyone know what Hasidic Jews are? Okay, you ever see a Jewish person, maybe a picture or on the movies, they have like these things, these twirly things going down their sides of their head. Anyone ever see that? You saw that. Okay, YouTube, what do you see? News, something, right? So Hasidic Jews are, are, are very pious Jews. If they're more insular. And they're very conspicuous. They, they, were, they were very ostensibly outwardly Jewish. Right? They were, not only were they a big kippah, they had long beards, like they, were, they, were, they were clearly very Jewish. So th- they told these Jews, dance for us. And if you don't dance, we'll beat you. Now, if you're conquered and you're overtaken and your, your enemies are telling dance, you're not really in a great mood to dance. So someone starts singing a song. And it's a, it was a Yiddish song. Yiddish, by the way, means Jewish. That's what Yiddish means. And many of the Jews from Poland... And then Russia originally were from Germany. So it's a Germanic language. They actually spoke a Germanic language. Uh, so they started to sing this song. And the song went like this. Let us become reconciled. It's a very religious group. Our Father in Heaven. But they really were not singing it. And the Germans started screaming to them. This is your last chance. Dance or we will beat you. And... Then they start to sing a different song. And this song went as follows. Again, in, in, in Yiddish. We will, this is 1939, when the Nazi army had just run over Poland and was, it was about to destroy Belgium, France, you know, all, going, going on all this. The, the next song they sang was, We will outlive them, O Father in Heaven. And to that song, We will outlive them, our Father in Heaven, all of a sudden it became electric. All of a sudden it became passionate. And these Jews started to really dance. And that's not what the Nazis wanted. When they saw them exuberant, they had to stop them. But that passion of spirit, that dedication to, to live, to, 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 if not living, but to, to exist and to go beyond is what I would highlight these Jews. There were Jews who said Shema every day on the death marches. There were Jews who kept kosher. Now, you understand what this is. Kosher is a type of, of, of food. The Nazis are not giving kosher food. But they would do whatever they can not to break their general principles and to eat the food that they believe what they're supposed to be doing. I'm going to tell you, you know, I know that you, this is a, a hard subject, I'm going to tell you a pretty strong story right now just to show you how far the passion went. There was a great sage, his name was the Blaj of Rebbe. He was in a, a, concentra- in a, in a camp called Janowska in the beginning. Did anyone ever hear, did you learn about Simon Wiesenthal? Anyone hear the name Simon Wiesenthal? No one? So Simon Wiesenthal, after the Holocaust, was a Jew who lived in Vienna and for the rest of his life searched and looked for Nazis. So he was involved in when the, the architect of the Holocaust, Adolf Eichmann, got caught and many others. He was in this camp. So this rebel said the following story. He said he was asked many times to discuss his experiences in the Holocaust, but he never did it. It was too traumatic. But one story he said many times, and it was the following story, which he himself was an eyewitness to. He said it was a morning in October 1942. And all of a sudden they were working in the Janowska labor, slave labor camp, and they started to hear screams. And what were the screams? It was the screams of mothers and fathers. Because at that day, the Nazis were collecting all of the children to be removed from the camp. It means anyone your age would have been taken away from your parents forever. The parents were saying goodbye to them. 
all of those children would die in the Holocaust. All of those children were sent to be murdered. So the parents, their kids are being taken, every parent there, their kids are being taken away from them. And he starts to hear these screams. And they're working, and they're sitting there crying, and they're working. And at that point, a lady comes over to him, this rebel, who's a, a slave prisoner and the person he's working with, and she asks them for a knife. She says, give me a knife. So this great sage, who lost his first wife and kids in the Holocaust, but rebuilt his family, with a new family after the Holocaust, tells the lady, don't, don't kill yourself. It's against, it's against God's law to kill yourself. Right? Tomorrow's another day. You don't know what tomorrow could bring. If you kill yourself, you'll have no opportunity. And she says, I want a knife. And at that point, a Nazi soldier overheard the conversation and like a Nazi would speak, he said, dog, hunt, dog. That's what we call them, dog. What did she tell you? And so the rabbi said, she asked for a knife. And I told her, Jews don't kill themselves. People, we believe there's a future. And so he, the, the Nazi said to this lady, he says, what do you want? She, she says, a knife. And then she looks at him, she saw he had a pocket knife. That knife. Give me that knife. And the Nazi got startled. He, you know, usually you wouldn't give a prisoner a knife. He gave her the knife. And at that moment, at that moment, the lady took the knife. She had had a bundle next to her. She undid this bundle. And inside that bundle was a little baby. And with that little baby, she took the knife... She said a Jewish bracha, which means a blessing. And the blessing went like this. Blessed are you, O Lord. I'm saying it in English. We would say it in Hebrew. uh, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your commandments to perform the circumcision. And she had a baby. It was her son. And she circumcised the baby with a knife at that moment. Does anyone know what a circumcision is? More. So it's on the eighth day. It's actually in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, from the time of Abraham. Uh, that there's a, a commandment which all, which all Jews and many others circumcise their children. It's actually one of the most important commandments. What it illustrates is that man is created imperfect, and we're in this world to perfect ourselves. Circumcision, is a, that's how Judaism ver- views circumcision. Well, this lady circumcised her son at that moment, and she said to the Nazi, now my son is a kosher son, and you can't take him away like that. And that, of course, the Nazi that took the baby and her. But the blood of the Rebbe said he was, for hundreds of times afterwards, he would sit by a Jewish circumcision, he would tell over the story how in the darkest of times, that this lady's greatest concern was to, to make sure her son was circumcised as a Jew. That she didn't give up her own self of, of sense of self and her own hope to do what to do to do uh, what's right. Um, the Rebbe himself actually remarkably uh, um, actually conducted a Passover seder. Does anyone know what a seder is? Okay, I, I'm going to assume most of you are, are, are of Christian background. So if you look at the Christian Bible, there's Jesus' Last Supper. Everyone heard of that? Maybe. That was actually a Seder, okay? That, that Jesus was Jewish. He was born Jewish. And that Last Supper was a Seder, right? It was a Passover Seder. So that idea of a Seder was what Jews do since we left Egypt. Now, I want you to understand something. The Seder is when we eat this thing called matzah. And according to the Bible, the first Seder was when the Jews were still in Egypt. Okay? The, the, how many, out of curiosity, I know we're, I'm not going to... How many of you read the Bible here? Okay. And how many of you read the book of Exodus? Not that many. Okay. So, uh, um, so in the book of Exodus, which I think the Bible is still the number one bestseller in the world, I imagine. Certainly world history. In the book of Exodus, uh, the, Jewish, the, the, the Jewish people leave Egypt, miraculously. Uh, but before they left, they actually have what's called a Seder, which is a remarkable thing. 
which means even when they were still slaves, they celebrated, they celebrated their redemption. And that's the thing here at one level. You remember when you're when even when it's dark, you need to see the future. It's a lesson for life. Even when you're at your most dark periods in life, you always need to see the hope and believe in a better tomorrow. And what the Blaj of Rebbe told those people in 1944 in a concentration camp is, there will be a better tomorrow. Even though today everything looks dark and everything looks evil and everything looks bad, there will be. If you don't give up. If you don't give up. Because when somebody gives up and they give up who they are, they give up what they believe in, then they've lost all hope and there is no tomorrow. So he celebrated um, a Seder in the, in, in the concentration camps. Uh, there were Jews who put on something called philosophies. I don't know what that is. I don't know what this is. This is called tefillin. If you, if you ever look, if you guys are bored, by the way, I don't know how you, if you can always look at these things online. They're, you know, just you know, to be multicultural over here. So it's in the Bible as well. There's something called tefillin, philosophies, which is put on their, on their arm and on their head every morning when they pray. And they do that to subjugate the arms facing the heart, on the head to subjugate the brain. And it all, again, it's in, in, in the Bible. Well, they were certainly banned. Uh, it, during, during, the, during the Holocaust. And there were Jews, uh, there are three documented things in Auschwitz that put these things on in three parts of the camp. Now I want you to understand, to put those on was a death sentence. If you did that, you would, you, 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 you would, you would, you would be, you would be murdered. And yet, Jews under the most dire circumstances went ahead and did that. What time did it finish by? 1025. So actually, I want to, I want to tell you a, a story on, on this also. Um, you know, there was a Jew who got a pair of tefillin. His name was Judah Wallace. And he put them on one morning, and a Nazi walked in. A Nazi walked in onto, onto them, into him, when he, when he put on this tefillin. And um, he said to him, take them off. He looked at his number. They were branded with numbers. And at roll call, he called, this is in the camp called Dachau. Dachau was the first concentration camp. It was in, it was in Germany. And it was already started in the 1930s to, 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 to kill all political opponents of the Nazis. He called out the entire camp of Dachau. And he called the guy's number. He said, get up here. And he said, he took the tefillin, took these Got these religious ornaments and he said because you wore this I'm going to hang you in front of the entire camp there's thousands means thousands of people are going to see this person hung and the Nazi mockingly said to him um, what would you want your last request to be what would you want your last request to be? And this Jew said, I want to wear these tefillin again. So the Jew put it on his arm. He put it on his head. And he's about to get hung. And he sees people crying in front of him. There's thousands of prisoners watching the scene. This Jew is about to be hung wearing these religious or- or- ornaments, with tefillin. And they're crying. And he screams out, Yidin, Jews, why are you crying? I'm the victor. I'm the winner. Why are you crying? And they're still crying. He's, don't you understand? I won. He didn't beat me. I'm the winner. And when the Nazi heard this, he said, you dog. You think you won? I'm going to give you a punishment much worse than this. He says, get down. And he told him, he made him hold tw- two bricks in a squatting position with his tefillin, and he said, I'm going to take the whip. I'm not going to hit you in the back. I'm going to hit you in your head with the whip. He says, if you drop one brick, I'm going to shoot you dead on the spot. Um, And he said, you might as well drop the bricks now because there's no way you're going to survive without dropping these bricks with 25 lashes to the head. And he, he said, I want to give you the pleasure. And this Jew started to be lashed. On the 25th lash, lash, he lost consciousness. 
they thought he had died, and they left him there. Somebody pulled him aside, and um, he ultimately, two months later, was liberated when the Americans came to Dachau. This Judah Wallace, his son today, ha- um, is, a, is, is a very famous uh, Jewish uh, person uh, in Israel. But well, remarkably, uh, after the war, a lady, a lady uh, came over to him. She said, I saw this, what happened to you. My parents were burned alive. I want to get married, and you want to marry you. And that's how we got married. But here's the thing, but I'm, I'm really limited in time over here. When you, when you hear this story, you know, there was a famous um, psychotherapist, and it was Viktor Frankl. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. Man's Search for Meaning, the Library of Congress says, is one of the ten most important books in the United States of America. This Jew, this psychotherapist, was in Auschwitz, and what he wrote was as follows. He wrote that the people who survived the Holocaust were typically religious or for people who saw why they're doing things. And in life, you need to know what you're living for. The, the, the people, who, the reason they, they, they lived this way in the Holocaust is because they knew why they're living. You know, if you don't know why you're living, then you, it, I mean, it, there's no reason to live, then death. But these Jews and these people had a, a very uh, purpose to live. And because of that, even after the war, they rebuilt their lives. My grandmother, she was 103 years old, she lost her first, when she passed away uh, two years ago, she lost her first husband, uh, parents, siblings. I never, I never heard my grandma, my grandma told me all kinds of stories about the Holocaust when I grew up, about her life. But I never heard her complain. Rather, she would tell me all the time, I want you to understand, most of us, we have terrible things. We sit there, we, we're upset for years to come. But she said to me all the time, thank God for every day. Appreciate every day. Say, say in Hebrew, say, Baruch Hashem Yom Yom. Thank God for every day. And because she lived that way, I, I'm here, my, I have I've quite a few children, and because there's always a positivity, there is always knowing that in life, the real victor is the person who lives the way they're supposed to live. It means the real victor were not the Nazis, because the Nazis are gone. I'm a descendant of people who were attacked by the Nazis. But the real winner in life are people who live the way they're supposed to live, who act the way they're supposed to act. Like I started with that story of the guy who threw the bread out the window when he didn't have a lot of bread. That is the real victor. And ultimately in life, if you believe in tomorrow, it could be a bad today, you will be successful. And it was because of these people's faith, it was because of their belief in the goodness, the ultimate goodness of man, that even when things look bad, that, that goodness will win. So I want to commend your teacher, Mrs. Kelly, for, for teaching the subject. It's not an easy subject. You know, you know, you're learning about what happened to a certain people, but it didn't have to be the Jewish people. It could be anyone in this world. And one thing you should always remember is that goodness and knowing what you live for and be, not giving up your convictions, that's the most important thing in life. And the, most, the people who are the real heroes in the Holocaust we're not just the people who fought back physically, but when you fight for what you believe in spiritually, a person who lives, a person who rebuilds their life after the Holocaust, gets married, rebuilds their family, follows their faith, they're the real victors. So I wish you success in your studies, and I thank you for inviting me today, and thank you for listening. I would like to thank you for that very moving story. Very touching. I hope that you got something wonderful out of it and that you have the ability to control yourself each and every day and bring your best self to the table. Um, In every situation, you have the ability to impact negatively or positively based on what you decide to do with your actions and your words. So let's, again, one last time, thank Rabbi Levine for being here and take to heart what he had to say today. Thank you. September evening Stretch into forever Where time never conquers The dream of old love
love has found It's alright now that she's close to hell And it's alright now she's kissed his toes your wings And everything that came before don't matter so much now Everything that came before don't matter so much now Everything that came before don't matter so much now And that's alright That's alright That's alright Ooh, that's alright That's all.